Well, my lords, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming along. This is the second time I've given this lecture, and the first time in front of his grandson, I focused very much on Lord Trenchard's role in warfare and as a leader of a fighting service and the consequence of his vision and leadership. Today, I want to take a different tack, very much in the sim similar mind to paying tribute to the man we're remembering today, but I want to talk about his role as a social visionary and a social reformer. And I must pay tribute to my dear friend Seb Cox, the head of the uh, aristocratical branch, who first put this idea into my head, the lecture he gave, which is still worth reading, about 10 years ago. And it isn't just a boring history lecture, for those who've nipped in from the MOD. I will then try and point out how this actually stood us in great stead 75 years ago in the Battle of Britain. And then I will fast forward, if you like, to why the four tenets I'm going to concentrate on are directly relevant to defence, not just the Royal Air Force today, in, as we implement the SDSR. So first of all, in times uh, of today, sometimes it's hard to remember just how tired Britain was in 1919, how much effort had gone into the First World War, how many people had been lost, how many people were grieving, how many people were trying to demobilize, how much churn there was here in Whitehall. And into that difficult situation came this fledgling service who had only emerged as an independent air arm a few months before, and that is for another subject, another debate, um, and was a, a long, hard-fought battle over that decision, strongly supported by King George V and enacted by the government. But only a few months later, Sykes, as the first chief of the air staff, found himself embraced in that struggle, as, of course, across the road, as we are today, they looked to see how we could retrench following the first war to start to pay the bills. It's very hard to put ourselves into that, into those shoes. Of course, the other thing that's really relevant here is amongst those exhausted and tired people, great waves of people were struck down by the Spanish influenza epidemic, which sort of weakened again the bureaucracy, including, in critically for three months, Trenchard himself. Nonetheless, he emerged to replace Sykes as the first chief of the air staff, having been commended to the new Secretary of State for Air, one Winston Churchill, by Lord Weir, his predecessor, and said, Trenchard's the man you want for the job. And one of the first things he was asked to do was to write something. And I have a copy here of what he wrote. He wrote, the permanent organization of the Royal Air Force, one penny of a white paper, and it's admirable for two things to young budding staff officers in the room, brevity and clarity. And it captured Winston Churchill's imagination as something that he could latch onto in his new role as Secretary of State for Air. And in fact, he was so pleased with it, almost unedited, it was published as a white paper very soon thereafter. And what are the big ideas in that very clear, very precise document? Really, it was about the Air Force's role and purpose was for flying and fighting. And he then turned it in a later speech to his officers at Uxbridge in an engineering and scientific age, which I think sounds pretty visionary, actually, when everyone else is looking to retrench. In fact, the Treasury were trying to say the forces, all three forces, the Royal Navy, the Army, and now the Royal Air Force, had to go back to their situation in 1914 and argue for anything beyond that force structure with which they'd entered the war. So it was retrenchment, if you like, with a big R. And I'm now going to pick out four threads, rather than talk about the organization. I'm going to talk about, so what did he do next? And the first thing he did was make very clear to government ministers and the cabinet that he was going to create an apprenticeship scheme. And he was determined to do this in order to meet the age we were in, in 1919, 1920, and to deliver what were then called air mechanics, we would now call them engineers, fit for that age. And this is really important because as early as, as January 1920, 
initially at Cranwell, a former Distinguished Royal Naval Air Station in Lincolnshire, 235 boys, using the parlance of the day, uh, embarked on that journey. Typically, in 1920, an apprenticeship scheme was five years. Trenchard said, no, we'll do it in three, and we'll give them a better education. And right from the start, hint, hint, for today's cyber warriors, that thought was underpinned by an extremely close relationship with the Royal Institute of Mechanical Engineers, who underwrote the contact content of the syllabus. So right from the start, this was his big idea. Of those um, boys, one and six a day if you're under 18, three bob a day if you were over 18. And you did your three years, you qualified as air mechanics, you went on. And of course, you were also fed and you were also clothed in uniform and allowed home on leave from time to time. That's also significant in the retrenchment after the First World War because, of course, that meant you were no longer a burden on your family. And what Trenchard also did in consultation with many members of the Cabinet was make it a regional offer and move away from the traditional recruiting grounds of both the Royal Navy and the Army and the traditional recruiting methods. So I would argue this was revolutionary and also visionary. 750 Halton apprentices, or brats as they became known, were, went on to receive awards from the Victoria Cross downwards, and many became pilots. Each year, and this genuinely counts as different, the top three students from Halton were commissioned at the Royal Air Force's expense and sent to Cromwell. And what's not clear from the primary sources, but I managed to find out with the help of Seb, is actually the Treasury fiercely resisted this idea on the grounds that these, these, would not, these boys would not make suitable officers. But it worked. It worked extremely well. And if you go to the little museum at Halton, you see around the wall many Air Chief Marshals, Air Marshals, Air Vice Marshals who took that route. And I think there are lessons for us for today which I'll come back to. The second thing he did, he wanted to train his office, officers in a different way. He was an army officer himself, a very distinguished one, and also done colonial service in Africa. And he built on that lifetime of experience now in his late 40s and decided that he wanted to do it in a different way. So right from the start, he had a vision for Cranwell, which was, by definition, a different vision. The numbers are quite interesting. The charge at Cranwell was £75 a year to attend, which is quite a lot of money. In addition, you had to pay for your exams, five subjects in a day at five pounds, one pound for each exam. You got paid 10 shillings a day though and graduated as a Royal Air Force officer and pilot three years later. A scheme that many of you know and is not worth me recording in any great detail because it's so well known. What is less well known was the second half of the revolutionary idea which was at the same time, at the birth of the Royal Air Force, Lord Trenchard introduced short service commissions. He was scoffed and ridiculed at the time, absolutely scoffed and ridiculed by many of his um, peers and many politicians. Not all politicians, some of whom could see it. So he developed his short service commission, initially to four to five years, later in the 1930s, extended to six. All officers becoming pilots, then going on, if they were specialists to either be engineering or equipment officers. This very simple initiative formed the backbone of an expandable service by having at its heart, at its rootstock, the ability to take a handful or a, a, a stream of officers through the Cranwell process over three years and then a much shorter process for pilots so you had a hard core of pilots inside the service. He didn't stop there. So we see apprentices and officers now at the heart of a flying and fighting service, but he goes further. And although he had a bit of an argument about it, by 1924, he convinced Lord Haldane, who was, of course, the great army reformer from prior to the First World War, that actually his scheme for the, what became known as the Royal Auxiliary Air Force and the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve was also needed, necessary, and visionary. And these, this role would be to serve inside the United Kingdom 
At the time, in the 1924 period, there was a fear of invasion from France. Got away now. But there was this sense that it was time to have a home defence force, which was known as the Royal Auxiliary Air Force. Expanded quickly, expanded regionally. It put the Royal Air Force in touch with cities, cleverly badged by city squadrons still to this day, and, of course, enabled people in those cities to become part of the Royal Auxiliary Air Force. And the more you read about it, the more you realise how clever it was and how it enabled, as the force grew and as missions expanded, this core of pilots and engineers to develop around the, the United Kingdom. Expanding to eight squadrons by 1934, 20 by 1939. And if you read um, books such as John Terrain's Right of the Line, you realise quite quickly that actually the ethos, the esprit, esprit de corps generated inside the Royal Auxiliary Air Force was even stronger in many ways than the, the regular service. So it wasn't just an idea of its time, and I think that's a relevant thought for today. I, twice the citizen, reserve service is worthy. It was also an enormous false multiplier when the threat was realized in 1939. The other much less known story, the fourth one, so we have the airmen, the apprenticeship scheme, the officers, the reserves. The fourth story I'd like to pick out is how even in the deepest, darkest days of austerity, which by now I'm talking 1928, Lord Trenchard decides to take six aircraft off every squadron in the Royal Air Force, bringing squadron size for the first time in its history down to 12, in order to pay for research and development. And he knew this would be controversial. He knew this would be resisted. He knew there'd be consent and evade. So he got the majority of his younger officers together at Uxbridge to tell them why he was doing it. And so his rationale for doing it was, we cannot continue with the machines of yesteryear. We must invest in research and development if we're to progress in aeronautics, aviation, weapons, and so on. And I hope you agree that those four thoughts represent both social visionary and social reformer. Of course, if we go back up that order, that enabled and set the conditions through the Air Ministry sponsorship for the magnetron valve, the radar, many of the uh, aerospace, air, air developments that led to the Spitfire, many other designs, as well as, of course, providing the backbone for the force as it modernized during the 1930s into the Second World War. The third innovation around the auxiliaries manned it, and they proved remarkably adaptable as types came and went and modernized, and there was never a thought that the Royal Auxiliary Air Force should not be equipped with the frontline types. It was not, repeat not, at all a two-tier or second-rate force. Officered and led by the products of the three-year course at Cranwell and superbly engineered, supported, and assisted, by the outcoming of the Holton scheme. So we see that by 1939, the Royal Air Force as it expands, expands on a very solid foundation. And that foundation included infrastructure, the, the often Cinderella of defense, because the investment in Cranwell to make it look as if it was going to last forever, to famously have Goering place it as one of the few sites in Great Britain on the Luftwaffe's no-strike list, because he wanted it, was a huge achievement. Beautifully designed by Lutyens, and a, a, a real feeling, a feeling of solidity, and we, as a service, you, as the officer corps, are here to stay. And, of course, it survives to this day. Same, same at Halton. That idea that this school, this apprenticeship scheme, is here to stay. So, as... We had to expand to match the threat, so this four-way system expanded accordingly. It didn't break. Reaching its peak in 1944 at over 1,250,000 people, based on those four key building blocks put in place by Trenchard. So I would argue strongly and passionately that as World War II begins, those building blocks create the conditions for success. And as the expansion takes new forms, such as the Commonwealth Air Training Scheme for pilots and other aircrew, 
as aircrew numbers expand dramatically to man the bomber offensive, so Trenchard's schemes hold firm and they are able to expand to meet the threat. Bring along our friends from the Dominions who expand with it. So he wasn't just the father of the Royal Air Force in many ways, you could say he was the father of many air forces. And it was that spirit, that ethos, that fighting spirit, because remember the Air Force was flying and fighting, that they took into the air in World War II. And it was that structure, particularly the structure around R&D, leading to those innovations that created the system that won the Battle of Britain. The pilots were the front end, the sharp end, the edge of the point of the spear. And we never forget their bravery and we commemorate it as we've just done for the 75th anniversary. But it was the air defense of Great Britain as a system that Trenchard helped to put in place that survived against the onslaught of the Luftwaffe and indeed took the Luftwaffe High Command by surprise for its resilience. Because in that esprit de corps, in that regular re reserves and auxiliaries, engineering manpower, there was a great deal of resistance which did not buckle or falter as, as the battle became a reality. And of course you could argue, I would argue strongly, that the same thought applies to the expansion of Bomber and Coastal Command, and I haven't got time to go into it all, but there was a great attention to detail on navigation, on an aerial navigation, and indeed on the future shape of larger aircraft for transport and coastal duties. I think, though, though I'm not going to be completely um, criticism-free here. I think there were criticisms within the R&D effort, even though Trenchard enabled it, there were still gaps. I'd be the first to admit that. I think we did not put enough emphasis on weapons and ammunition, uh, whereas, of course, the Germans with their cannons did. I also think there was a rather slavish following in the Air Ministry to, and this is perhaps relevant to this day, to specifications, where sometimes the Air Ministry specification would specify things to a point of tactical nonsense, such as the famous one I always quote, the Bolton Paul Defiant, in many ways a good aeroplane, except the tactical modus operandi for the fighter was to lure the enemy into your six o'clock and then let him have it with four 303, millimeter, four, four 303 guns, when of course the enemy was armed with a 20 millimeter cannon. So that was tactically inept, uh, leading to the relegation of the Bolton Paul Defiant quite rapidly to second line duties. I could talk about the terrible gun sight on the ferry battle and so on. So I do not say there was n this is a faultless system. What I do say is that Trenchard, through his wisdom and his drive and determination, his follow through to make sure people were doing what they've been told to do, created the system which expand dramatically and led us after World War II into the jet age. The second observation then is of course that the chiefs of air staff, as indeed for first sea lords and chiefs of imperial general staff, who command in the aftermath of major world conflict have got a lot to do. The Air Force reduce, reduces from 1.25 million to just over 200, between 225,000 in a year, overseen by Lord Tedder who is very much in the mantle of Trenchard and very much sees the survival of the apprenticeship scheme, the officers' uh, school at Cranwell, as well as, of course, the engineering effort as essential as the Royal Air Force transitions to the jet age, nuclear weapons and beyond. So it would be a stretch to say that Trenchard foresaw V-bombers and so on. I would not stretch it that far, but he would have been entirely comfortable that those modern devices with which we fought the Cold War were the, sub, uh, were the product of those four focuses that he'd embarked upon. And again, you can argue that the many of those designs saw us through the period from the end of the Cold War through the many contingencies which Air Chief Marshal Pulford, Chief of the Air Staff, spoke of at this lecture last year. All of those contingencies were fought with the same spirit and the same ideas. And you can therefore, I will conclude for the next few minutes by suggesting that the spirit of Lord Trenchard is alive and well, Mr. Chairman. You see in the 2% pledge by the government, 1.2% on defence spending, and we'll be back here tomorrow with Minister for Defence Procurement and myself talking about that. 
So I intend, don't intend to steal tomorrow's sandwiches too much, but we are very committed to science and technology, research and development, and doing it differently as we'll reveal tomorrow. With many more opportunities for small and medium enterprises, which I think Trenchard would have welcomed, many more opportunities for new and exciting disruptive technologies, which I know he would have welcomed, and weaving together our requirements with what industry can produce in a quicker production cycle than perhaps hitherto we've had, which was also one of the problems in the 1920s, where quite often the air ministry try and keep all the companies happy rather than derive the best product or output for the Royal Air Force and other parts of defence. So the growth you see in, in the SDSR is very real and very important that we see it as growth. Air power does well, both in ISR, combat air, I'll come back to, and air mobility. We see a number of new airplanes and types, both long weighted for, such as A400M, uh, long now in service, but really quite exciting as we think about the future with the C-130, as well as, of course, C-17. On combat air, you don't need me to say very much. It's been so much prophesied and so much nonsense talked about air power for such a long time in the last few days, all I'll say is both Tornado and Typhoon are very busy. Very busy in all the traditional roles, but applied with the sort of precision air to ground that Lord Trenchard would have been proud of. In fact, Lord Trenchard encouraged bombing competitions and all the rest of the paraphernalia that went to air power demonstrations in the 1920s and 30s. They were not just air shows, they were demonstrations to watching audiences of capability. So combat air is busy. Our air mobility forces are busier than ever. Air-to-air -air refueling forces. Don't forget that air-to-air -air refueling began with great skill and bravery as early as 1929 in the United States with a gentleman climbing out the back of a World War I bomber with a big jerry can pouring it down a funnel into a hose and connected to another aeroplane while standing on the wing. So early steps. But today we have tankers around the world dispensing fuel and thereby extending reach. So many of the roles and missions are not new. The ways in which we operate may be not new. There's very little. I think Trenchard, towards the end of his life, said there's very little new or strange in this world. So nothing really has changed. And bear in mind the backdrop of when Trenchard was chief of the air staff was permanent crisis in the Middle East, occasional dramas in the Far East, and everything always dragging the Royal Air Force's attention operationally back to the Middle East. So I think he would have recognized today's crises. I think he would have also recognized the whole force approach. And here I'm being very serious. Perhaps the commentators are seduced by equipment, technology, headlines. Actually, the whole force approach is really, really important. So again, we look back to those 70 years previous, 80 years previous, and think about where, how we grow the Royal Auxiliary Air Force including flying, how we grow the Royal Auxiliary Air Force, the Royal Naval Reserve, and the Army Reserve to be more relevant in output, to be on all our missions overseas, more importantly, perhaps, to be the specialist backbone of our ability to understand what's going on in the United Kingdom. And we're doing that via the numbered squadrons that Trenchard created around the country, expanding quickly, and it's really impressive to watch just as the expansion of the Royal Naval Reserve is impressive to watch. My own view is the future reserves proposition, beset by difficult headlines at the beginning, is an idea of its time. And we can go back to the idea of voluntary reserve service as something special, noble, twice the citizen, as Churchill said. And then, of course, in R&D, I don't know what it means if we take a great chunk of our R&D spending and put it into disruptive technology. You know, it might be something around big data, it might be robotics, it might be other things. But if we prescribe it, we can almost guarantee it won't become a program or project reality. So we do need to encourage a bit of exploration once more, a bit of pushing at the boundaries. Again, small, medium enterprises, come and help us with this quest to provide that next generation of stuff, thinking, and equipment that can be disruptive and keep us safe. So when I look back over Trenchard's life, I think in addition to all he did 
for the service as the father of the Royal Air Force, it's worth remembering how much he did for the nation and how now it's automatic in all three services to have an apprenticeship scheme. Although I still chide the occasional audience for not realizing the Ministry of Defense is still the biggest creator of apprentices in Great Britain. Just we don't perhaps say that often enough. We're still one of the largest by volume graduate employers via graduate employment schemes in all three services and we're expanding those schemes. We're still one of the primary employers of engineer, engineers in Britain ranging from nuclear where we have 13 separate initiatives running to develop nuclear skills through to engineering, through aerospace engineering, through other forms of engineering. So again, Trenchard and his colleagues on the Imperial Chief of Staff Committee would recognize this today. They'd recognize much of the SDSR and we've built, I hope, with faith on the foundations laid by Lord Trenchard to be socially innovative as well as closing with Her Majesty's enemies. Thank you very much.